of those in, in Chile for, for, for uh, just giving our students this, this amazing um, opportunity to undertake their practicum projects with you. And, and um, lastly, I just wanna thank our amazing Office of Field Practice team, um, a team that works so diligently, so passionately uh, to make sure that our students have just a wide array of practicum sites that they can choose from for their field experience. Um, so thank you to, to Cassie and Anna and Nettie and um, Carol and, and Batia for all that you do for our students uh, through the field practice office. And of course, a big shout out to our student presenters. Um, I look forward to uh, learning more about the work that you did. Um, and I just wanna extend my apologies in advance. I have another meeting at one o'clock, so I won't be able to see all presentations, um, but nonetheless do know that my heart will be with all the students. Uh, so best wishes to you. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to provide welcoming remarks. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very, very much, Michael, for, for your words. And um, yeah, this is a great opportunity for mutual benefit. Uh, students conduct great research and, and uh, they really help us, you know, and, and our students, you know, to, to have a global engagement and, and create opportunities to advance research and knowledge. Um, so we're very happy to, to do this uh, and to continue doing this. Um, so our first presenter will be Alejandra Martinez Zamora. Um, she will be presenting on the politics of COVID-19. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, okay, so hello, my name is Alejandra Martinez and I'm a rising senior in the health policy and management department at Millman. I'm currently pursuing a master's in health administration, and my practicum project was in COVID-19 economic support policies in Brazil. So this is the agenda for today. We'll start by discussing the project background, then the purpose, methodology, findings, and lastly, recommendations and next steps. So first, the project was in collaboration and under the guidance and mentorship of Universidad Mayor Society and Health Research Center. From the start, the project was centered on studying COVID-19 policies in Latin America. And I was really interested in this particular project because I wanted to learn more about health policy to complement the core management foundation I'm gaining at Millman. And moreover, a lot of the classes are focused on the United States. And I wanted to dive deeper into global health and especially into Latin America, which is home for me. So after reading the literature, we found that governments respond to the pandemic in three different ways. First, containment policies or mobility restrictions like closing schools or closing borders. Second, economic support policies like income support and debt relief. And third, healthcare strengthening policies like increasing ventilators, investment to health infrastructure and vaccines. And so we saw a lot of research on the relationship between containment policies and public health outcomes, but literature was scarce for the relationship between economic support policies and public health outcomes. Most of the research on these policies centered on the macroeconomic impact they had. And so we were interested in, in further exploring that relationship with public health. So we decided to focus on Brazil for three reasons. First, it's the biggest and most populous country in Latin America. Second, it has been the epicenter of the pandemic in the region and has been an important center even at a global scale. And third, it has implemented the most economic support policies in Latin America. And we'll focus at the state level because policies were implemented at this level. So purpose. The purpose of this project was to explore the relationship between economic support policies and public health outcomes. And we did this by dividing it into three sub questions. First, do Brazilian states with economic policies fare better than states with no economic policies? Second, do Brazilian states with greater economic policies fare better than those with lower economic policies? And third, the question we'll be highlighting today, is there an enhanced effect in states with lower GDP per capita or higher, higher Gini scores? But before that, going through this process brought several challenges. And although this was a project within the center, they gave me latitude to do a more in-depth study in my area of interest. Therefore, the biggest challenge was defining the problem and coming up with the questions with the data at hand. And this definitely took several iterations. The second biggest challenge was data collection. We had to create our own data set for Brazilian states, which meant figuring out which data sources to use, which variables would be most useful for the project, while also doing so in a different language, in Portuguese. So Spanish was really helpful for me here. 
And throughout the project, figuring out what the next steps were, like what do I do after linear regressions and deciphering the interaction plots and their significance beyond the statistics was also challenging, but I got a lot of guidance and I am very grateful for that. So now diving into the actual project. We collected data from various sources. Our main data set was the Oxford Government Response Tracker, tracker data set, which included Brazilian subnational data on policies in COVID-19 cases and deaths. We also use the Google COVID-19 Mobility Brazil reports for mobility data. And as previously mentioned, we created our own Brazilian state data, data set, which included data such as population, density, and percent population voting for President Bolsonaro that were compiled from multiple sources, including the 2010 National Census, Ministry of Health, Brazilian Medical Association, and the Superior Electoral Court. For our main variables, our dependent variables were the measurements of public health outcomes. And we explored three measurements. We used new cases divided by the state population and multiplied by a thousand to get the seven day moving average of new cases. This will be the variable we will focus on in this presentation. The other measurements were the moving average of new deaths and mobility changes. Now for the independent variables, our variable of focus was economic policies. And actually the Oxford data set provided an economic index a continuous variable from zero to 100 with higher numbers meaning more policies being in place. We also created a binary variable with economic index equal, equaling zero, meaning no policies, and economic index greater than zero, meaning implementation of policies. And this is the one we'll be highlighting today. The other two variables of interest are GDP per capita, which measures economic output per person and also state resources, which in other words is a way of distinguishing between richer and poorer states. So for comparison, Brazil's GDP per capita is around 8,000 US dollars, while the GDP per capita in the United States is 65,000 US dollars. And now moving to the second variable, which is Gini. This measures the distribution of wealth with higher Gini index scores, meaning higher inequality. So now our findings. This is a plot of the 27 states in Brazil and their moving average of new cases. We found no major difference across the states to our surprise. And next we plotted the economic index where we found great variance between states, namely poor states, Acre, Goas, Minas Gerais and Santa Catarina. They implemented no policies during the study time span. The mean economic index was 17.94, the median was zero, and of the 11,731 data points, 47.14% had implemented policies. We mapped this economic index and we found no regional differences. However, on the other hand, when we mapped the GDP per capita in Gini, we did find regional patterns. The Northern states have lower GDP per capita and greater inequality compared to the Southern states. And this is actually in line with the Latin American pattern with poorer countries having greater inequality. We also see great variance for GDP per capita, which ranges from 15,000 to 100,000 Brazil reais, but little variance in Gini from 0.45 to 0.6. Next, we conducted several different regression models and found a positive association between having economic policies and public health outcomes when no interactions were present, which are these ones. This makes sense as the greater number of cases might trigger politicians to roll out more policies. But we also found that this association is dependent on GDP per capita and Gini index as the interaction effects are significant. And there is a greater difference for Gini as the interaction coefficient is larger. And so we plotted these interactions. And here you can see that on the X axis, we plotted the binary variable, zero having no policies and one having policies on the Y axis, on the y-axis, we plot, plotted the seven-day rolling average new cases, and we also plotted different levels of GDP per capita and Gini scores. And we see the different effects on new cases regarding different levels of GDP per capita. We found no difference when no policies in the GDP per capita, but in major states, which is the green line, we see that the economic policies are applied when cases are on the rise. And on the second plot, we see that economic policies are implemented in a completely different way. In unequal states, which is the green line, they are implemented when cases are on the rise, while in equal states, which is the red line, they are implemented when cases are decreasing. 
And for this project, this is where our preliminary results conclude. So given this, in the continuation of the project, I would recommend for a lag component for policy be added, as it takes time for behavior to change after policies are implemented. Likewise, this continuity regression should be done for mobility, which I didn't show in this presentation. And the input of resilient experts is absolutely essential for, for the validation of methods and results. I also want to take this time to thank everyone who helped me throughout this project. First, to CISS, and especially to my supervisor, Professor Cabezas, who helped me and mentored me throughout the entire process, as well as Rosario, who made the connection possible. Big thank you to Anna and the field practice team, Professor Ana Esteban for the Spanish lessons, and Marjorie, who was instrumental in my practicum search along with the rest of the HPM team. Thank you for listening and for being here. Are there any questions or comments? Oh, Jose, you can, um, or Alvaro, I think, uh, whoever is writing on the chat, um, you can just open your mic and... Um, um, yeah, th thank you so much. I, I, I like to start just, uh, first of all, congratulating Alejandra and, she, and her enthusiasm and, and, and how much she got involved in the project. Uh, actually, it was quite easy for, easy for me to do this since I had such a, such a good... Uh, partner, but also uh, to, to highlight the fact that the results are really, really, really challenging. Uh, I'm really glad that she mentioned at the end that there's definitely the need of having the input on a Brazilian expert. I mean, we have a, a, a box full of tools, but we are not experts in that particular, such a huge country. So that's definitely one, something that we are not able to, to tackle right now because we're not experts in the country. Uh, but it also uh, faces the challenge that we have a lot of tools, we can learn a lot of, a lot of other stuff, but when, when we do comparative politics, we do need to know respect to particular countries. Uh, there are a lot of uh, cultural issues or differences that may play a huge role that we are not able to capture using just data set or object observational data. Um, so again, I, I am really thankful for the process, but also too, I would like to encourage her and everybody else to keep working these uh, such great uh, projects. Thanks. Maybe I can say a small thing. Um, so congratulations, Alejandra and Jose. Very interesting uh, work and interesting results. Um, yeah, my, my question was basically if you're planning to continue with this work, maybe to print to publish the, this, um, maybe, I don't know if you're planning to expand or make something comparative in the Latin American context, just what are your plans for the next few weeks, months? Oh, well, thank you uh, for that question. I think that the project is very interesting. I haven't, like I said before, the literature is very scarce on this particular topic. So I would be interested to continue researching um, more in depth, really, what is going on with these preliminary results. All right, we, we have time for one more question. Um, if not, we can move uh, to the next presenter. All right. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Ying Chen. And um, I think, yes, uh, she was working with uh, Dr. Rocha on, on a project named uh, When Reality Overcomes Intention, a study of migration and depression symptoms among Haitians living in Santiago de Chile and Tijuana, Mexico. 
Okay, um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, um, can people see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Yi Jing. I'm an MPS student at Melman um, in the Department of Social Medical Sciences. And today I'm presenting on my practicum project which investigate the mental health status among Haitian migrants in Chile. Uh, so in this presentation, I will first give an overview of this project, including the objectives and design of the study, a little bit on the background on the current migration patterns, and also some of the preliminary results based on the data that we've collected so far. So this project, um, as Dr. Carvo just introduced, is about the relationship uh, between migration experiences and depression symptoms among Haitian migrants living in Chile and in Mexico. The primary investigator is um, Dr. Teresa Tarocha Jimenez. And basically what we're trying to looking at is to see how um, some of the new migration and mobility patterns have influenced um, the depression status among these migrants and especially in light of the recent pandemic, how that might have um, also have an impact in their life and mental health status. So my role as the practical student is to first to conduct some literature reviews on the existing research between the um, relationship between migration and mental health and also on some of the more recent studies coming out about how the pandemic has impacted migrants' mental health. Um, I also performed some data cleaning and analysis um, on the data that we collected so far, so the planetary results in R, and also helped put together the team's presentation two weeks ago. So recently, I also did a brief review um, of news covering U.S. policies on migration, specifically on the U.S.-Mexico border. So the main objectives of this study is to estimate the mental health status of Haitian migrants living in Chile and Mexico, because there is a gap in literature about this population. So we want to look at um, what the actual situation is and also to evaluate factors of vulnerabilities and resilience. So how can factors such as social support and discrimination play in their experiences and their mental health status? So we're collecting um, data in two sites, one in Mexico, one in Chile. Um, our instruments are provided available in both Spanish, the local language, and also in their mother tongue, Haitian Creole. So we, don't, uh, we won't miss any valuable input because of language and cultural um, competency. Um, so the overall design of this study is to first collect 210 surveys. Um, so they're mostly um, quant quantitative results. So we have um, some brief overview and some general findings about um, what their situations is. And then we were planning to conduct 30 qualitative um, in-depth interviews. So to prop deeper based on the results that we, ha that we will have um, from the surveys. And the participants are recruited um, using the respondent-driven sampling, which is similar to snowball sampling, which um, our participants will refer future possible uh, respondents to our study. So a little bit about the current migration patterns. So traditionally, Haitians are migrating more to countries such as the United States, but in recent years, they're migrating more and more to Chile and Mexico. Um, because of a mix of social and political factors. Um, we can see on the left, um, this is data from Chile, that the migrant populations in Chile is um, kind of steadily on the rise. And also on the right, we have data um, from the Mexican government, specifically looking at transit migrants. So those who migrate to Mexico in the hope of migrating to other countries, so specifically the United States. Um, and we can also see that the numbers has been on the rise in, in the recent decade, basically. Um, so this is some of the preliminary results based on um, 37 surveys that were collected to this date. 
So basically, um, because of the COVID nineteen pandemics, we have only we only have data so far in um, on our sites in Chile. So um, that's what I'll be presenting on. And this we have a pretty diverse data set in terms of age, marital status, um, and um, also in terms of gender. We have seventeen women and twenty men. Um, we can see that uh, a majority of our participants completed primary school or above. Um, but in terms of their employment status and financial situation, as the numbers are looking pretty bad, um, the unemployment rate is close to 70%. And as you can see in the figure on the right, that um, about 80% of them say that their economic situation is either bad or really bad. Um, and also in light of the current political turmoil in Haiti, about like a third, so 30% of our participants do have children living in Haiti. So that could be a factor um, in terms of how their mental status will be. So to measure their depression status, we use two scales. So first the Center of Epidemiological Studies scale, which is um, very well to use internationally recognized. And we also use the Zemi Lacente scale. So the Zemi scale, was originally developed in Haitian Creole in the language and also in the Haitian context. So by using these two scales, we hope to get a more accurate estimate of um, the mental health status in these migrants. So um, as you can see from the two graphs, the distributions are very similar, um, but in terms of who met the cutoff scores for clinical level this depression, there is quite a large um, discrepancy in terms of what the two scouts gave us. Um, and in terms of their migration experiences, um, also kind of a diverse age range um, in terms of when they left their country or region um, in terms of reasons. So about half of them said that they left the country to seek their dreams and to change their lives. And uh, additional 30% said that it was because um, there's no work opportunities in Haiti. And also about 70% said that they, they already have plans to come to Chile when leaving their home country. So this is not like an arbitrary decision that they just happened to end up being in Chile. And when they arrived in Chile, um, kind of like about 70% reported some kind of a negative emotion, sad, um, fear, or anguish, but also a fourth said that they were joyful or excited to come to Chile. So um, on the graph on the left, there's generally um, pretty big impacts from the pandemic in terms of um, how they're living. So the majority being the pandemic has caused some economic problems, but there's also like um, emotional issues and also change in housing. Um, but also we can see that 20%, about 20% of them said that the pandemic hasn't had any impact. Um, in terms of their migration plans, about 70% said that because of the pandemic, they had they have changed their migration plans uh, and the majority being that they decided to move to a different country. Um, so here's like a correlation matrix. So in the association between several factors. So one thing, um, two things to point out. So we have seen that the CESD scales um, and the ZEMI scales have some discrepancy, but here we can see that they're still pretty strongly correlated. So that kind of validated our results and say that is um, the estimate will be somewhere between the range that uh, up to two scales. And also social support um, seems to be pretty strongly negatively correlated with both the scores on both depression cells. So uh, whether that's due to maybe a buffering effect or like a more direct positive effect is uh, worth more investigation. Okay, um, so that's all that I'm presenting today. And I want to acknowledge at all of these people and all who have participated in this study for their hard work. And some of the references that we use in this presentation.
and also um, personal thank you to all of the people who have supported me through this practicum experience before, during, and after um, from Melman and from um, University uh, Mayor. And also um, thank you all for um, coming and listening to my presentation. Um, any questions? Thank you, Yiying. Um, I just have a, a quick question in terms of uh, the last slide that you showed us, the one that shows the correlations. Um, you recently worked on that, and I think that slide is very useful in terms of observing uh, the correlation between both instruments and also the social support. Um, and then I was gonna ask you like, in you know the data and you are very skilled in analyzing data. Uh, do you recommend anything uh, in terms of like later on in the data collection um, in how to keep analyzing the, like both instruments, the mental health instruments? Yeah, um, I would just say that, um, so the mental health instruments versus um, are highly correlated. So that's kind of like validating. Um, but I was also um, think that further investigation into the parts that why they're, the parts that they're different and looking at um, maybe like which items even, uh, which part of the scale are making those differences um, or maybe worth looking into. Um, so maybe in the future, so people who use this scale to study patient people can um, be more like kind of like linguistically and so culturally competent um, in terms of what they're asking. Um, and also, um, yeah, and also with like, so this is only part of all the analysis that we can do with um, the really diverse and really good data that we have. So. I feel like um, there's a lot that I can do about the data. Yeah, and uh, Jose is asking how challenging is dealing with RDS. And we haven't, we didn't incorporate any of the weights of the RDS just because we only had 37, but it has been very challenging to implement the codes uh, process because people are actually moving, a lot of them are moving to Mexico. So if you give them a code to invite other participants, some of them are not uh, in Chile the next week. So I'm actually thinking of stopping the RDS just because it has been very challenging. And at the end, RDS is very useful for hidden population. But in this case, now that we have uh, people that we know in the different communities, maybe RDS is not that, uh, like I'm trying to improvise as the field work is kind of showing us different, but we haven't, like so far everything has been through RDS and we do have the information of how the participants are linked. So we could still use that information. Yeah. I think Nico and Antonio was also asking. Uh, Shall I start? Well, thank yeah. you very much, and okay. congratulations. That was very interesting. And I loved this um, uh, association matrix. I liked your own reflection about uh, what might be going on with this relationship between social support and, and depression schools. But the other variable that shows some interesting associations is this changing of plans. I don't remember, maybe you can come back to that slide uh, uh, if you want, it would be, would be great because this changing of plans is somewhat associated with almost everything else. So uh, if you have yeah. some interesting reflection to add to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's like some pretty interesting association happening here and especially um, like pretty strong correlation considering that this um, this kind of gender plan variable is only like a binary thing. 
Um, so I don't, I'm like kind of not sure what's actually happening here because the only one that I, like, I personally um, can't kind of make sense of is that, so the more impacts you have from COVID, then like it's more likely that like your plants change or something, right? Um, so the top right one is pretty easy to interpret, but in terms of um, discrimination, social support and depression, um, like this is mere speculation, but maybe after they decided that um, to change their plans, they feel more like comfortable or um, whatever. Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, Antonio also put a, a, a question. Yeah. yeah, she wrote down, um, how is potential selection bias going to be controlled for doing the analysis? Uh, do you, I mean, we didn't, we didn't control for anything so far, but can you, do you wanna expand on that, Ji Ying? <laughs> yeah, so there are, um, there are methods out there that we were planning to use um, when we have more data that can like kind of correct for this selection bias um, due to RDS. And it's basically kind of weighing in different, weighting in like um, the network in terms of like how people are connected to each other, if that makes sense. So one person may be given more weight if um, that participant is connected to like more participants because they're likely, or like, um, yeah, like, they, like kind of, kind of like balancing out the facts that um, some participants um, by this chain of referral may share more similar views or um, that kind of stuff. Um, I also have a question. Um, so I, I thought it was very interesting to uh, learn about the emotions that migrants experience when, when arriving to Chile. And and was a mix of emotions, you know, sadness, joy, excitement, fear. And, and I was wondering, I, I know very little about migration, but, but I can imagine it can work as a, as a pull or a push, right? It might be a want or a need and probably a little bit of both, right? Uh, so I imagine it's possible to experience more than one emotion at the same time or intermittently, right? And um, did you explore that or are you planning to explore that? Because I think that could be fascinating to, to learn how uh, people experience a, a matrix of emotions or navigate from one emotion to another in different stages. Yeah, um, that would be interesting looking at. So this variable that we have so far is like, I believe it's a single choice um, variable. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think we, it will be more interesting when we talk about it in like long interviews where they can like actually articulate how they how they were feeling and how they have changed. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So the idea is once we identify certain experiences or uh, maybe even we're asking about suicidal thoughts, we are contacting those participants for. Uh, in, in case they want to talk with a psychologist, but also to invite them uh, to uh, to participate in an in-depth interview. And the idea is to explore more of this, like this trajectory of how did you feel when you arrived and how this has changed over time, uh, depending on their migration experiences, job, and also now that the pandemic and it's and that it has been very difficult for them to uh, stay in Chile, how they feel right now. And so, yeah, we will definitely explore that in the in the interviews. Right, this is not just migration, it's migration during a pandemic, right? Yeah, extra challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have one more minute for a quick final question. All right, um, well, thank you for this great presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we are now going to hear from Kajana Whitaker and Carlene May um, on their project about the violence epidemiology in Chile. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Cabo mentioned, we are 
presenting our research on the description and analysis of violent deaths in Chile from 2001 to 2018. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm an MPH candidate in the Department of Biostatistics, and I'll pass it over to Katya now. Hi, my name is Kachana Wiedeker. I am also an MPH candidate and I am in the Department of Epidemiology. I would also like to preface this with um, the fact that this project is still in progress and we're very grateful for the opportunity to keep working on the results um, for, for multiple weeks. So just a quick outline of the presentation today, we will be looking at an overview of our project our methodology, the preliminary results, and then finally we will touch on our current conclusions and our next steps. So for this project, we are working with the Society and Health Research Center at the Universidad Mayor in Santiago, Chile, under the supervision of Dr. Alvaro Castillo Canelia. And the purpose of our study is to describe current violent mortality rates and trends in Chile between 2001 and 2018. So at present, the description of violent deaths in Chile has been limited to specific intentions and methods of violence and does not always include the most recent data. So our study has yielded um, a very in-depth and uh, overall descriptive uh, description of violent statistics um, and has stratified rates and trends by intention, violent intention, so i.e. homicide or suicide, and then mechanism of death. So like firearms, poisoning, suffocation, et cetera. We are also utilizing spatial analyses in our investigation to determine whether violence is heterogeneous over different regions in Chile, as well as look at the influence of population dense areas on violent mortality rates. So understanding how violent mortality rates have changed over the past two decades in Chile can help utilize epidemi epidemiological patterns in the creation of solutions to prevent and control violence in the country. Finally, we're using, using publicly accessible data from the Department of Information and Health Statistics from the Chilean Ministry of Health. So the impact of violence overall on global public health has been recognized as a really important concern for mortality rates throughout the world. And as defined by the World Health Organization, violence is the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. And it can also influence life expectancy, socioeconomic development, mental and physical capabilities, and high-risk behavior in affected communities. Violence is the fourth leading cause of death for persons aged 15 to 44 years old in the world. And it accounts for more than 1.3 million deaths each year globally. And in Latin America specifically, there has been an increase in interpersonal violence in the past few years. And as of 2017, Latin America has one of the highest rates of homicide in the world at about 24.7 per 100,000 persons and is home to 42 of the 50 most violent cities in the world. What is interesting though, is that the violence in Chile is a little different. Um, previous statistics for Chile show that the country actually has a low homicide rate of about 4.9 per 100,000 persons and a high suicide rate of 12.1 per 100,000 persons, which is a reversal of what we see the standard is in Latin America. Um, there's also previous evidence to suggest that mortality rates do differ by region and so that is kind of the background of what we are investigating uh, in this project. So moving on to methodology, we conducted a population-based study of persons with a violent cause of death in Chile from 2001 to 2018. Statistical analyses were performed using R and uh, the data that we received from the government was fairly cleaned. Um, so we just then finished cleaning and compiled that into working variables in order to gain a better overall idea of what we were working with. Then analyses were performed in order to identify trends in violent deaths and draw comparisons between world mortality rates, Latin American mortality rates, and previous statistics on Chile to see changes, as well as look at how violent deaths differ by region in Chile through geospatial analyses. 
So the variables included in the study were year, age, sex, intention, method, and municipality. Data was filtered based on whether a person had a recorded violent external cause of death. And these were determined using codes from the International Classification of Diseases 10th revision. Through these codes, two main categories of violent related deaths were determined, homicide and suicide. Homicide was defined as injuries inflicted by another person with intent to kill by any means and included the codes noted. Suicide was defined as intentionally self-inflicted injury that results in death. And since Chile was not in a state of war or a political unrest during this period, violent deaths due to war and legal intervention were not included. The categories of violent intention were then further broken down into method of death, either cutting and piercing, drowning, falling, fire and heat damage, firearm, vehicular, poisoning, striking, suffocation, and undetermined methods. Age was divided into five different categories, 0 to 14, 15 to 24, 25 to 49, 50 to 64, and above 65. And each municipality um, was given a category. So it has 345 municipalities across uh, 16 regions. So from these variables, descriptive and summary statistics were generated from the raw data, including stratified population percentages for the different variables. So these summary st statistics include determining what proportion of violent deaths in Chile were male, what proportion were female, what proportion were suicides, et cetera, et cetera. Then mortality rates were calculated and to account for the fact that the population size and demographics in 2001 are not the same as they were in 2018, we standardized, we standardized rates by age. So age adjusted mortality rates per 100,000 persons were calculated for homicide, suicide, and overall violence, as well as age adjusted sex specific mortality rates. Average rates spanning 2016 to 2018 were also calculated to get the most up-to-date average. And then time trends by sex and intention were calculated by means of simple linear regression using year as the independent variable to determine, to determine the beta one coefficient and associated p-value. So the linear regression model, it just models the relationship of one variable to another, in this case, time to mortality rate, just to help us identify whether one variable could predict another and find a trend. All right, so in addition to those descriptive analyses, we also utilize spatial analyses in our investigation to determine whether violence is heterogeneous or homogeneous over different municipalities of Chile as well as look at the influence of population dense areas on violent mortality rates. So to do so, we focus on what is known as the standard mortality ratio or SMR. So SMR is given by the equation here. Um, we calculated it for each intention and each mechanism of death for each municipality in Chile. So as you can see, it's given by observed deaths out of the expected deaths based on that municipality's population. So this is known as the crude SMR. And an SMR greater than one means that the number of observed deaths is greater than what would be expected um, in comparison to the national rate, while an SMR less than one means that the number of observed deaths is less than expected. So as previously mentioned, Chile is comprised of about 345 municipalities and they all range in geographic area and the size of their population. And because of this variability, our estimates of the crude SMR can be imprecise imprecise in places with extremely small areas or with very low populations. For example, if you were looking at one of the smallest municipalities in Chile and just one person dies, we could end up with a very large SMR just because of that small base size, um, which might not be indicative of the story of the municipality as a whole. Uh, so to, co to combat this, there's a number of things that we can do in an attempt to do what is known as smoothing and re in reference to smoothing the variability of the SMR. So the gold standard for doing so is known as a Bayesian hierarchical model, which takes into consideration um, the spatial dependence of these municipalities. So in other words, there could be similarity between SMRs of a particular municipality year after year. So for example, it's possible there is a degree of similarity of SMRs in for example, the municipality of Santiago year over year, and that could be dependent on specific geographic or attributes that have to do with Santiago itself. So this Bayesian hierarchical model would account for this. 
Um, but to do this, we would need a shape file for Chile, which is a file that holds information on the geospatial data and attribute information of the geographic features. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to get this file yet, so we are still ongoing with this Bayesian model. But in the meantime, we are implementing an intermediate method of smoothing the SMR. Um, so first we use data that we aggregated recently from the years 2016 to 2018. So we could look at the recent trends. And again, using this aggregated data, we instead implemented a Poisson model, which is an alternative that is um, perfectly um, uh, valid uh, method to doing so. So Poisson distributions model counts so in this case, we are modeling death counts and we're assuming that these death counts are nested within the municipalities. And we did these using um, R and Stata and GIS to make maps. So moving on to our general results, general descriptive analyses showed a total of 47,113 violent deaths in Chile between 2001 and 2018. A majority, 82.4% of these deaths were male and 15.8% were female. The average age adjusted mortality rate for this period was 15.9 per 100,000 persons. And the age group with the most violent deaths was 25 to 49 uh, at 50.5% of all total of all violent deaths. Suffocation was the most common method of death overall. And uh, in the overall population, there was a significant downward trend in violent deaths uh, for suicides and homicides with p-values of less than 0 0.001, uh, as you can see from the graph. So female mortality rates for overall violence and suicides did not reveal any statistically significant trends, uh, the graph shows them kind of static uh, and their p-values were over 0 0.05. However, even though it is hard to tell from the graph, analysis did show that female homicide rates, however, are slightly trending downwards with a p-value of 0 0.003. It's just that rates are decreasing very slowly, um, but there is still a significant linear trend. There was definitely, though, a signif significant evidence of a downward trend across all categories of mortality rates for males. And as you can see, compared to the graph for females, mortality rates were much higher than women across all categories of violent death. So now we will go into a breakdown of our two main categories of intention, homicide, and suicide. And as you can see, out of the 47,113 violent deaths, there were much more suicides than homicides. And then each category was broken down into mechanism of death. And uh, it's not too surprising that the methods vary fairly widely between the two intentions, um, with suffocation being the most common for suicide and uh, with cutting and piercing being the most common for homicide. So looking at suicides specifically now, um, suicides made up the majority of violent deaths, like noted before, with a total of 33,119 violent deaths. The majority of these, mess de the majority of these deaths were male, 82.4%, and the mean age was 42 years old. The most prominent methods of suicide were suffocation, firearm, and poisoning. The average suicide mortality rate overall was 11.3 per 100,000 persons, and for men, the rate was 19.1 per 100,000 persons. And for women, it was 3.8 per 100,000 persons. Time trends show that suicide rates are turning downward in the population, except in the case of women. Moving on to homicide, there were 13,994 13 homicides in Chile between 2001 and 2018. And like suicides, the majority of these deaths were male at, with 88.3% being male. And the mean age was 35 years old. The most prominent methods of homicide were cutting and piercing by firearm and then by undetermined causes. The average homicide mortality rate overall was 4.6 per 100,000 persons. And for men, the rate was 8.3 per 100,000 persons. And for women, it was 1.1 per 100,000 persons. 
Time trends show statistically significant downward trends in homicide rates across the overall population, and both sexes had p-values less than 0 0.05. All right, so as I brought up earlier, we're interested in calculating SMR as a means to estimate the death rate of each particular municipality in comparison to the general population. So here we've plotted the distribution of all the crude SMRs for all the municipalities. So since there are 345 municipalities, we took the crude SMR for each one and plotted it, and you can see that in the distribution here. So we can see here that there is a peak at one, but the right end of the tail does go out pretty far um, to four and there are a good amount of zeros in this crude SMR distribution. And as we mentioned that this could have to do with the fact that there are some municipalities with very low populations. Uh, but then using the intermediary step of using the Poisson distribution to model the SMRs, we ended up with this new distribution of the smooth SMRs for each municipality. So as you can see, there are no more zeros um, using this new Poisson distribution, and there's less of a variation across. Um, the distribution is much tighter, and the maximum only goes to about two. Um, next, we split up the smooth SMRs into five categories and plotted them on this heat map here. So as you can see, this is a map of Chile with each color representing a different municipality. Uh, the lighter areas indicate lower SMRs where observed deaths were lower than expected and the darker maps indicate a larger SMR where observed deaths were higher than expected. So again, we repeated this step again for homicides uh, specifically. As you can see here, there are a lot of zeros in this graph in this distribution and the tail goes all the way out to six. But again, using our smoothing methods, that distribution is uh, much smaller in variability with a peak more so around one. And again, we've created a heat map for that. As you can see, it appears that the northern regions of Chile um, have higher SMRs than perhaps the central and southern regions. And finally, we ran this again for suicides. Again, a similar pattern for the crude SMR, um, a longer tail towards uh, the higher end with a few zeros, but again, a peak around one. But again, with the smooth SMRs, a much tighter distribution with less variability. And finally, here again is the heat map for the SMRs for the suicides. Similar to the other graphs, uh, we can see that it's split up in five categories with the lighter colors being uh, lower and the darker colors being higher. Okay. So moving on to the discussion, there were some limitations with our research. Um, while we cleaned and prepared the data, we ran into some limitations on the quality and the consistency of the data that we had received. So before 1997, Chile used ICD-9 to code deaths, and after 1997, they used ICD-10. So while conversion is still possible, it's not always consistent uh, between the coding systems, and it can lead to poorer quality of data, which could possibly have affected the results of our research. Uh, additionally, uh, before 2001, there were a high number of violent deaths that were coded as undetermined, so that could be a possible skew in how deaths were being recorded, which could potentially have obscured the true numbers of suicides and homicides in the population. So that's why we excluded data before 2001. And finally, in more recent news, uh, COVID-19 has obviously impacted the way that deaths are recorded and external causes of death have not been included in recent reporting due just to the high volume and percentage of deaths and the high urgency of reports related to COVID. So this could create gaps in mortality information from 2019 to the present and moving on. Um, and in conclusion, across Chile, uh, results show that violent deaths such as homicides and suicides are trending downwards. A possible reasoning for this is in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Chile began introducing more legislation to try and curb violence and work toward enforcing those laws. Um, so that could be a reason why we're seeing a, de a decrease uh, over the past several years in the violence rates. 
So while there are, while disparities in violent mortality rates between sexes remain, um, there's still progress being made, uh, as we can see from our data too, that there's progress being made to decrease violent deaths. So in general, violent mortality rates for the country are comparable to world mortality rates for homicide and suicide, and homicide is lower compared to other Latin American countries. A potentially interesting finding that we found is we did see that female suicide rates have become relatively static and there should perhaps be efforts to determine possible contributors of this issue that could help to better understand female mental health risk and effectiveness of suicide prevention initiatives by sex. And as we mentioned earlier, this project is still in progress and we'll continue working on the results for a few more weeks. Um, but our current focus is to continue refining results, specifically working more with our spatial analyses, um, determining differences between regions, and delving deeper into those results, as well as organizing our findings um, for a publishable paper in the near future. Um, so thank you again so much to everyone um, present here at this meeting, as well, especially to Alvaro, our PI, Rosario, and Dr. Calvo at the Society and Health Research Center. Uh, Professor Anna Esteban for our Spanish lessons and Anna and everyone at OCP at Mailman for their support throughout this project. All right, are there any questions? I have a question that it's not fully direct, uh, fully related to research. But I am curious to hear your experience working together, being from two different departments, and what kinds of skills and competencies that you learned in the classroom you've been able to use. So I would like to hear your comments about that. And if there's time for others, I would love to hear um, about that too. I think for me specifically, um, it's just been really good practice to calculate and analyze some of these, you know, basic descriptive statistics and um, and analyze it, you know, from an epidemiological context and in in a, in a frame in that sort of frame. But um, it's I, I've enjoyed working with Caroline because she is taking the lead on a lot of this geospatial analysis. And while I have heard about the Poisson models and the Bayesian hierarchical models in class, you know, I hadn't ever really delved into them. And while she is working mostly with them, I've been able to learn about them just through, you know, looking at her her analyses and, and her data sets and and the emails that she's emailing with Avro and things like that. And it's it's so it's been good exposure and I'm I'm really grateful for it. Uh, yeah, to piggyback off of that, um, a lot of this Bayesian and geospatial analysis I haven't actually learned yet from my classwork, but so Alvaro is like a really good resource just to kind of get my feet wet in this topic because it is just something really interesting. Um, I think the maps and the visualiz visualizations are something I'm really interested in working in. So just working with Alvaro and getting that opportunity to work on something that I haven't even like touched in the classroom yet is a really like good privilege and opportunity to do. And working with Katjana, she's been working on the paper mostly uh, so recently while I've been working on this geospatial analysis. So just kind of seeing her go through that process of writing the paper and the steps that it takes and the iterations is also really good like knowledge for myself to have. So I think overall, um, we've been collaborating really well on this project between the three of us. Thank you. Do the other students have any comments on in terms of skills and competencies or anything like that? Um, I can talk a little about it. I think for me, I did take a class in R, but we didn't really go in depth, not as much as I did in this project. So that was definitely a plus and just learning more outside of the classroom because I'm more management based uh, was really helpful as well. Yeah, um, for yeah, for me, because I didn't learn the skills um, in classes um, more than I having like kind of my past research experiences, um, some work 
that I have um, and more just like going um, like learning how to do that as I was doing that because um, that was really interesting to looking at all the um, methods that specifically designed for RDS and how they're trying to balance off the selection bias and all the other stuff. And also I learned a lot from Teresita and the team in general, just um, like kind of work how how's working the field look like and um, like all this like little tips I wouldn't be able to learn. Just yeah. Thank you. All right, um, we have some time for some closing remarks. Uh, Teresita, do you wanna begin? Yeah, um, I just really wanted to thank um, Ana and Rosario for organizing this and making the practicum a success. Uh, this is my second time collaborating with students from Colombia and it has been online both times. So at some point, I really hope we can do this in person. And it has been a total pleasure. And both students who I work with were very committed. They did outstanding work in little time. And actually, the student who I worked with last year um, recently submitted a paper to the Harm Reduction Journal. And as you saw, Yi Ying did an excellent job in conductive. Um, all these uh, lead review and the, the analysis that she did. And I just wanted to highlight that the role of, of the students are fundamental for our projects too. So for me, it has been amazing to be able to push this manuscript and this analysis, and I wouldn't have done it without their help. And I mean, I hope that the student's experience was as rich as it has been for me. And I really am looking forward to keep collaborating with, uh, with the students and with this program. So thank you. Thank you, Teresita. Um, Cassie. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for this incredibly exciting and informative um, set of presentations. And like everyone else, I would just like to thank all those who are involved, uh, the Society and Health Research Center, the Global uh, Center in Chile, um, Dr. Calva, Dr. Menez, and Rosario. I, I too hope I have a chance to, to meet you in person as well. Um, but also, I think one, this is the second year that um, our office of field practice has been trying to create um, international practica when students can't travel globally. And uh, we have learned so much from year one. We continue to learn more uh, from this uh, set of um, practica experiences. But I think the two important things that we learned from doing this last year was the need for a well-defined project and is combined with the need for um, close collaboration with uh, site supervisors. And as it has been um, expressed here and manifested here, those two qual qualities have certainly been highlighted in the sense of these well-defined three very challenging issues. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for the, to the supervisors, uh, to the faculty that's been behind you as well. And most importantly, um, to our four students for their commitment and their hard work. Um, maybe just one final comment. I know our office and also with the um, expertise of our, of, of our new Dean, uh, Michael Joseph, we've been looking at the capacity for the practicum experience to highlight the SEEF competencies. And here again, I think the presentations really identified the skills for data analysis, data cleaning, the wide range of skills and methodologies that have been uh, presented here today has really been um, quite extraordinary. Uh, also, the, in all the presentations, the other uh, seed competency is the sensitivity towards cultural differences, and that came through in all of your comments and your data analyses and interpretations. So thank you again for including us in our office. Uh, uh, is just delighted to extend and continue this collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Landers. Anna, um, do you want to some closing remarks yes thank you very much and uh just following and piggybacking on what dr landers already said 
thank you so very much to each of the students. Uh, you have shown again your hard work and your dedication and have done masterful presentations that we are very proud of. And so thank you, thank you very much uh, to Alejandra, Yijing, and also to Katya and Caroline. Um, you made us really, really proud today. And so I would like to thank everybody present, including uh, the opportunity that these kinds of, uh, of presentations that are remote give us. And so we have, I wanted to acknowledge our representatives from all the departments that the students are participating in. And I won't go into names because of the time, but thank you so much for your continued support to our students and to our office in increasing our capacity to get to your students. And I wanted to thank the Global Center uh, for your support and participation. Uh, and thank you, Chris, for being here. And last but not least, Esteban, all the professors, investigators, and our star coordinator, we could not do this work without you. I want to particularly thank uh, Jose Cabezas, uh, Teresita Rocha, and Alvaro Castillo, who were the supervisors of these four students. But I would like to also acknowledge Nicolás and Antonia, um, who are present here today, and anybody else I may be missing, uh, for your continued support. It was no small feat to turn a presential practicum into uh, online, an online program. But thank you for your availability. And so thank you, thank you, Esteban. And uh, of course, um, I, I really would like to say, Rosario, uh, you make all of this possible and easy and <laughs> pleasant. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. It has been my pleasure also working with all the students and with you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, especially to the students. And I, I want to put these three projects in perspective. You're applying classroom learnings into a field setting that is very different from the US. And that is a really valuable experience to gain real world skills to, to promote public health in a, in a global setting. And, and, and that's a major achievement of this uh, collaboration. But you're also highly qualified and dedicated students and, and you're making a huge contribution to our research agenda. These are longer term uh, uh, projects and, and as faculty, both at the Society and Health Research Center in Chile and at Mailman, nothing makes me happier when I find these opportunities for mutual benefit, right? And um, we, we have labeled this collaboration as, as the Building Healthy Societies Project. And, and I think all the three projects are, are a good example of how to build healthy societies. And, and, and we have recently formalized this collaboration through an MOU and, and, and you have successfully finished your practicums and, and, and you're done with your requirements, but you're all invited to, to continue collaborating with our faculty. And hopefully if, if the pandemic permits, at some point in, in the long future, maybe in a different galaxy, <laughs> you will come and visit us in Chile. We have been waiting for so long for this to finish. Uh, but, but you're invited, you know, past interns have turned their projects into, into capstone projects, theses, funded proposals uh, for different agencies, you know, Fulbright sponsors, uh, international exchanges, the United Nations has also funded some of our students, so, so uh, you're all invited to, to find ways of, of continuing, this, continuing this, this amazing, amazing uh, job. So thank you, everybody. And then Rosario has been recording this uh, uh, event that, that we will make available uh, uh, to all of you and, and whoever wants to, to look at it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take oh. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.